Oh, uh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm Latif Nasser. I'm Lulu Miller. This is Radio Lab. Okay, should we do this thing? Yeah. And today, we're going to start with a story from our producer, Christina Becca Bressler. How did you stumble across this? How did this little guy possess your brain? Okay. Um, I, I basically, it was my turn to pitch something. And I was in like a dark Airbnb in Portland with my friend um, in January and just feeling like totally... Uh, lost for for inspiration. So I did a thing I actually never do when I'm looking for pitches, which is look for an animal story. Because <laughs> okay. I actually, okay. I don't even really like animals that much. <laughs> like, I honestly am one of those people that I think pets dogs because I'm afraid of being judged if I don't, if I don't <laughs> bend down and pet the dog. So like, that's, that's how like animal agnostic, like is a- apathetic, like I actually am. Anyways, so like, I'm Googling animal, like science news, clicked the animal header section and came across an article about it. it, This is, it's just this little creature that to me struck me as a total genius. Hmm. And, uh, and that's what I want to tell you about. All right. I'm sort of still eating my breakfast. Also, for some balanced reporting, I dragged in animal lover, producer Annie McEwen. Hello. Okay, so this animal lives in these shrubby fields. A bushy kind of open landscape. In Uh, India, uh, just outside Bangalore. It is quite an isolated area. This is Ritik Deb. He's an evolutionary ecologist at Vishwa Bharti University. In West Bengal, India. And he says to find this animal, you go out in the evening. In complete darkness and walk out into the center of this field and just stop. Stand completely still. And you wait for their song. Generally, on an average, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so. The song of... A cricket. A cricket? Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know if I'd call that a song. Like, it's like a chirp. I no, mean, no, no. I'm going to call it a song. All right, stick with me here. Okay, all right. Fine, fine. Okay, so these crickets are called tree crickets. And just to give you a visual, they're sort of a translucent green. They've got little tiny wings. They're around one centimeter long. One centimeter, so like your pinky finger? Half of the pinky finger, Half, I would say. So like a pinky fingernail. Slightly bigger than that. Slightly bigger than a pinky fingernail, depending depending on who you are. Is it hard to find? It depends on where the cricket is. Once it happens that we hear a cricket and every time we go to a location, it feels like it's calling from behind us. Huh. We turn, mm-hmm. we go to another location and then it strikes us that it's calling from within our backpack. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is... And their song that Ritik uses to track these little guys down, that is the thing that makes them so interesting. Yeah, it's a hugely costly phenomenon. Ritik explained that the male crickets, who are the ones who sing the songs... For uh, three, four hours in the evening and they... Lost. They do this to attract mates. Hmm. And every night a male cricket sings, it can lose up to 20% of its body weight. <gasps> Whoa. It like sings itself skinny? <laughs> yeah, it'd be like you or I losing 25 or 30 pounds in one night just to find a mate. Huh. And this is actually a classic conundrum in evolution. Uh, like you would find it across so many different organisms. And uh, Darwin it, first noticed it in peacocks and it became known as the peacock puzzle. A peacock's tail is such a... So a peacock's thing. tail, as grand and beautiful as it is, by the theory of natural selection, kind of shouldn't be. It it, it prevents them from being able to really fly well. It gets them, like, caught up in bushes easily. Peacocks are absurd. (laughs) Totally, totally. And they really puzzled Darwin. Fashion over function. No, exactly. classic fashion over function. Totally. And fashion over function in science is actually just called sexual selection. (laughs) There's there's an official (laughs) term for it, which, which is that. Darwin eventually figured out that 
females prefer peacocks with extravagant tails. And therefore, those peacocks mate a bunch more and they have many more offspring. And that is why that trait survives. Right. So these crickets are kind of like the peacocks, except that instead of having a big, colorful tail, they have a very exhausting, but super sexy (laughs) song. Hmm. And Ritchick would eventually discover actually that the the sexiest songs are the louder songs. Um, so females like loud, loud songs. Got it. But the genius in this cricket, the thing that made me fall in love with them so much is that some of these little guys uh, give their little cricket middle finger <laughs> to this beauty standard. What? <laughs> How? What do you mean? Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you. So... One night, Ritik is out in the field looking for crickets like he does. Another PhD student was also helping me with sampling. And then he hears this song. I hear one cricket which sounds louder than usual. Like louder than he's ever heard before. It's so loud that it feels like it's just near my ear, but there is no bush there. It's like the cricket is in his head. But but not, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So we start searching for that particular cricket. He's moving through this field. I am like trying to overarch through top of a bush. <laughs> it was really hard to locate it. Yeah, we are completely exhausted. Neither of us can find the cricket. <laughs> and then suddenly I see that there seems to be a hole in the middle of a leaf. Hmm. And uh, there is a tiny head which is popping out through it. A little hole about the size of a penny in this leaf. And inside it, the head of a tiny tree cricket. I was like, what what am I looking at? And then I call my friend. We now are investigating mode. Like we are looking from the back. We are trying to look from the side. And what they eventually see is that this cricket is singing from within this leaf. It's calling from the hole of the leaf. So he's like, that's weird. (laughs) Yeah, this is something very, very unusual. Because these crickets, they're always on the leaf. They're never actually in the leaf. My uh, supervisor had given her mobile number and had told that only in case of emergencies, you should call. And uh, I frantically search for my mobile (laughs) and I call her immediately. 911. (laughs) Yeah. And she told him, you know, I've actually heard about this before. It was written about in some paper a few decades ago. This was a publication which came out in 1975. So what he saw, it wasn't just some fluke. Does it have a name? They called it... Baffling. And the name that they gave to these crickets uh, was they call they called them bafflers. Bafflers. Mm. Okay. Why? Why bafflers? So the leaves with the holes are called baffles, and a, a baffle is a surface that reflects sound, basically. Mm. Oh, okay. So the leaf is like sh- taking the vibrations of their song and shooting it out into the field. Yeah, basically. You can think of a megaphone kind of a thing, right? So in other words, if you took that cricket out of the hole, it would be quiet. And if you put it back in the hole, it would be loud again. Huh. The the paper also explained that these crickets in the holes, they didn't just like fall into a hole. They created the holes for themselves. They chewed them with their little cricket mouths and they uh and they climbed inside them to amplify their songs. Whoa. Wow. I, so they're like fashioning a tool exactly. like a little insect tool exactly wow, uh, wow. okay that, that is that's crazy smart. right that's pretty it's, cool yeah okay but this raises a very real and interesting question for Ritik. does this work like we said before when it comes to these crickets females generally prefer louder individuals louder is better Now, sometimes they have to settle for a quiet cricket. Based on how much energy you have spent searching. Oh, uh, like your standards lower. Exactly. (laughs) Very relatable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, But if given the choice. It will always go for the louder one. And it's not even just that a female cricket prefers a louder cricket to a quieter cricket. She'll, She'll actually mate with that louder cricket for longer than she would that quiet cricket. And here... Ritik has found a quiet cricket, pretending, using this leaf megaphone thing 
to disguise itself as a loud one. And so the question is, do the females actually get deceived? Do they treat this cricket like a loud cricket? Do they stick around and mate with it for longer than they would if it didn't have that baffle? Or can they spot the con? Is she like, I've Catch. been punked? Or totally. is she like, yeah. let's do it, whatever. Yeah. It will all boil down to the point whether the female can catch the bluff. And so Rittick did an experiment to test bluff, this out. And what he found was that the female cricket... It spent equal amount of time with a quiet cricket whose call has been amplified by using baffle with that of a truly loud individual who already calls at that particular loudness. The female crickets mated with the bafflers just as much as the naturally loud crickets. So uh, it was like... Wow, indeed the cheating is working. It's just ingenious. Like this little cricket that by no fault of its own isn't supposed to mate that much has found this incredibly clever way of leveling the playing field, of of sort of like playing with the the big dogs and like keeping himself in the fight. But, like, to me, I don't know. I'm, like, a little hesitant because, like, considering it from the female side. Yeah. What the hell? Like, this is false advertising. The, the whole idea of sexual selection, as, as I understand it, is that the, the peacock's tail or the loud cricket chirp, that, like, like, that suggests genetic strength. And, and the reason that it's lasted for so long in the cricket world um, is because— Loud guys are better mates. They're going to produce stronger offspring who are more likely to survive. So, so now what? The, what this this kind of hack? This is a bait and switch. A lie. Like this is <laughs> not. This is not fair. But this cricket is a genius. Like I, I guess that's where I come in. Is but is he even? Is he an evil genius? Is the question? No, I know. I- I've, like, self-reflected on this a lot and whether or not, like, I should be ashamed that I am endorsing this type of deception. (laughs) However, a couple other ways you could think about it. The loudness might just signal this is a good one and I should spend more time mating with it. And so whether that is a cricket that is just naturally louder or a cricket that has figured out a way to make its own calls louder, like, that is a pretty, that trait, like... I don't know. I feel like that deserves some recognition. I don't know, though. Vex, like, it's still, a, it's still a lie. It's still a trick. I just, this is the guy, this is the animal that, that wooed you over into liking yes, animals? Yes, it is. Okay. And, okay, I guess, I guess the other reason that I want to defend this male cricket is, so in the peacocks, peacocks have developed these beautiful tails because females choose and they like big, pretty tails, right? So it's like this whole sex of peacocks has adapted just to be chosen as a Mm. mate, used for its body, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, my feeling about this male cricket is it feels like in a way that what, what we're seeing is crickets not narrowing in into some like homogenized version of the cricket that is the most likely to get chosen. This cricket's like fighting for itself. It's like, I might not measure up to your beauty standards, but I deserve to survive. And so I'm going to find another way of doing that. Producer, animal lover, Becca Bressler. I wrote a song about the cricket. Oh, sing me the song. Can you guys give me a beat? I guess it's like... (laughs) They rub their wings so they don't die alone. They use the leaves as a megaphone. They spread their seeds to get the ladies going. They use the leaves as a megaphone. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! Thank you so much. Next up, we've got another underdog story for you, but we are leaving the fields of India and heading onto the field in the American South. 
Hi. Hi. We'll do that. Latif. Lulu. Radio Lab. Next up, we've got another story about some little guys trying to do a big thing. Okay, let's just huddle up, circle up. Yeah, okay. circle up, circle up. What are you here yeah. to tell us about? Yeah. Great question. Okay. From producer Annie McEwen. All right, let's do it. Okay, so picture a college football field in Atlanta, Georgia. What season? It's fall. Uh, it's fall. It's October. Okay. And it's a warm day. It's like 70 degrees plus, and it's humid, and the fans are cheering from the stands as the players jog out onto the field. Georgia Tech versus Cumberland University. The game is about to begin. A familiar scene in the U.S. today. Yeah. Except these players, instead of bulky pads and giant shiny helmets, are wearing little leather caps and knitted socks pulled up to their knees. Because this game happened in 1916. Oh. Okay. Okay. And the spectators in these stands are about to witness history. Something that could never be repeated. Because this football game should never have happened. Well, it wasn't just a football game because that's ridiculous. Who would do that? Here to help me explain is Cumberland history professor Dr. Tara Mitchell Melnick. I am a ninth generation Tennessean, so we've we've been here a while. <laughs> so, so this game, this football game, when did you first hear about it? I don't really know. I feel like I've just always known about it. I think that's kind of one of Cumberland's claims to fame or infamy, maybe. I'm not sure. Okay, so let's just begin. Um, if you could just tell me what happened. Okay. So back in 1916, Cumberland had had some financial difficulties. The university needed to tighten its belt, cut its costs. Decisions had been made. Football had been cut out. And Cumberland no longer is going to have a football team. Now, a game schedule had already been drawn up for that season. So Cumberland had to reach out to all those schools and say, We're sorry, but we don't have a football team. We're not going to play. And every school said, no problem. Except for one. Georgia Tech. The letter they get back from Georgia Tech University says something like, You are under a contract. This is a legal contract. If you don't play this game, we are going to sue you for $3,000. $3,000 back then is like $80,000 today. Some people say it was going to bankrupt the school. It was going to close the school. Why was Georgia Tech being so like stubborn about this? Why, why wouldn't they just let them off the hook like everybody else? Well, this part of the story is a bit murky, but according to legend, Georgia Tech was pissed off at Cumberland. Oh. And not just anyone at Georgia Tech, specifically their head coach, a man named John Heisman. The power, the magic of the Heisman Trophy. Have you guys heard oh. of John Heisman? No. The yeah. Heisman Trophy. Before I let you go, who's the Heisman Trophy winner? The Heisman Trophy could be decided in this. So SEC the Heisman champion. Trophy is handed out to the best college football player every year. Hello, and it's named after one of the most famous college football coaches in history. No one can deny the genius that is Heisman in football. Ladies. This guy invented the hut, the snap back to quarterback. Oh credited with popularizing the forward pass. Without him, football just wouldn't be the same sport. He is the guy. And he kind of looks like this terrifying god, like high cheekbones, strong, stern brow. Ooh. And his coaching style was also sort of godlike. You know, we don't lose, don't show weakness. Uh, he was sort of famous for opening each season with a speech to his players where he would hold up a football, look them all in the eyes and say, Better to have died a small boy than to fumble this football. Whoa. Yeah. And why was Heisman so angry at Cumberland? Well, as the legend goes, it all had to do with this Cumberland student named George Allen. George Allen apparently is kind of the big man on campus. He's 20, clean-cut, ordinary-looking white guy from the 19-teens. Huge into frat parties. Everyone's favorite bro dude. Got him. He is the student manager of both the baseball and the football team. And when Cumberland University canceled their football team, George Allen had this idea. And it was this idea... The legend goes, that would make John Heisman so pissed. Okay. Okay. So George Allen, he's feeling school spirit drop. And one day he's like, <clears throat> if Cumberland baseball, if the Cumberland baseball team can really hit it out of the park at their next game, then maybe the loss of the football program won't sting so much. He's trying to show the world the school's still sporty. Yes. 
So he sneakily hires all of these minor league players, these professional baseball players. Quote, unquote, ringers. Guys that, who weren't technically Cumberland students. To put on the Cumberland College uniform and play in this, like, upcoming baseball game. And who are they playing? They're playing Georgia Tech's baseball team. Oh. Which, for some reason, is also coached by John Heisman. Oh, no. Yeah. And the game is just a complete blowout. There are these, like, professional players playing these kids, basically. And they're just, like, getting bored, <laughs> hitting so... everything. At some point, they, they just start bunting. So unfair. <laughs> and they eventually win. By a score of 22 to nothing. Cumberland school spirit is back. But John Heisman is not happy. Yeah, I could see why. And so when Cumberland says, hey, we're not going to make that football game in the fall in Atlanta because we canceled our football program, Heisman basically says, up yours, George Allen. We are going to play this game. But the problem is Cumberland doesn't have a football team. We've eliminated our football program. Hmm. And so George Allen steps up and says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play this game. But there is no football team. So what does he do? Basically, George Allen just starts recruiting on campus. Petitioning all these young law students. In their late teens and early 20s. These, like, life pale figures you can see in the halls of the library or out partying. They were not anti-party. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) And George Allen is like, we need your help. The school needs your help. Um, Alma mater is asking for your help kind of thing. And people step up. Somewhere between 16 and 18 students. Do they, have they played football before? Some of them have. A couple of the guys did, that had been football players like in high school. So there is some sense of what does this game look like and how do we play this game? It's not like they're complete novices. Right. So they quickly scramble to raise money for train tickets and hotel rooms. And when the big day arrives, there's a huge send off in Lebanon. Everyone comes out to cheer on the boys who volunteered to save their school. You know, they're waving banners, big signs that say things like wrecked tech. Oh, wow. And then they catch a train and go to Atlanta. And as we head to Atlanta, I'm going to bring in Radio Lab's production coordinator, W. Harry Fortuna, because Harry, I think, is the only one amongst the four of us who knows anything about football. I'm here to help. Okay. October 7th, 1916, Grant Field, Georgia Tech University, a thousand Tech spectators in the stands. For Cumberland, it would have been a big crowd. They would have been probably a little bit in awe of the number of people who had come out for this game. It reminds me a little bit of that scene in Hoosiers where the basketball team goes into that great big stadium and they're kind of like, oh my goodness. (laughs) This is big. And they don't have equipment managers. They have to all carry their own equipment. and They had barely any pads. It's those old uh, leather helmets, leather heads. Barely more than a hat on your head. I don't even think there were mouth guards. On the sidelines, suited up with the rest of the players, George Allen says a few words. We're just trying to make this work. We've got to play this game and get home. And as the ref flipped the coin up into the air and it fell, flashing in the sun, turning over and over and over, there was this feeling from the Cumberland side that maybe we could do this. We could really do this. Turns out to be something they're going to talk about for the rest of their lives. (laughs) Because from the very beginning of this game, things start to go sideways. Georgia Tech wins the toss, and they elect to kick off. They kick the ball, it flies through the air, it's caught by a Cumberland player, who then turns to see a wall of Georgia Tech players hurling towards him, and he freezes. Edwards, the Cumberland quarterback, uses his body to block an oncoming Tech player and is immediately knocked out cold. (laughs) The guy holding the ball, the guy who froze, is also flattened. And Cumberland... They can't get out of their own territory. They end up punting it, but... The punt only goes 20 yards. Not a lot. Not a lot. Tech gets possession of the ball and quickly runs it into the end zone. Touchdown for Georgia Tech. On the first play. And I just want you guys to go ahead and access that YouTube file that I've sent you guys. Oh, Um, great. Because this is a song that plays every single time Tech gets a touchdown. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Let me play. <laughs> hell of an engineer. Georgia Tech kicks for the extra point, 
And after less than a minute of play, the score is Tech 7, Cumberland 0. And that first touchdown is just the beginning. Georgia Tech begins to run that ball over the line again and again and again and again. Touchdown after touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. The home crowd is losing their minds. And very quickly, it becomes pretty apparent this is... This is going to be a problem. Cumberland is getting clobbered. They're being tackled. Hit in the face or the head with all kinds of body parts. Your arm, your head, your shoulder. Just whatever it takes to bring him down. That's football. Jeez. Quarterback Edwards makes it back out onto the field, but is immediately knocked out again. Oh, come on. (laughs) He's carried off the field again. And basically every time Georgia Tech touches the ball, they run it into the end zone. And the Cumberland players are like, this is bad. Just a ridiculous slaughter of a football game. They do finally get to halftime. What's the uh, score right now? The score at halftime is um, 126 to nothing. 126 to nothing? Yep. And many of these players now would have been pulled out for concussions. They would not have been allowed to continue, but it's a different time. In a normal game, there would have been just a forfeit. But if Cumberland does forfeit, then they will have to pay that $3,000. So money. they have to stay to the mm. end of the game. Got to keep going. And Heisman? He was not holding back. He also doesn't trust George Allen. He's like, mm. well, maybe he brought in oh. some ringers. And George Allen is over on his sideline just trying to exhort his team. He's like, okay, we're halfway there, guys. Just stick it out. Halftime came to a close. We can do it. We can do it. We just got to get finished. And and now that the goal of winning has been fully abandoned and it's all just about running out the clock, all kinds of instincts kick in. Survival, fight or flight. Some Cumberland players begin to run away from Tech players. <laughs> There's even one Cumberland player that he's like, every time Tech got the ball, I turned around and I ran with the Techs. And that was the way that he was like trying to protect oh himself. God. Once in a while, it sort of felt like they had a chance, I guess, because there's one story where a uh, Cumberland player has an open field to the goal line. He is running. He is going to make it. <gasps> Cumberland. But no, Cumberland. he falls. He trips over one of his own <laughs> teammates who is on all fours looking for his glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Third quarter begins. Our friend Edwards, he was knocked out twice. He's back in the game. Okay. Someone gives him the ball. He throws it to a teammate who throws it back. Neither of them want the ball. If you don't have the football, you can't be tackled. So they're standing there, tossing it back and forth and back and forth. It's almost like a hot potato football. Until a tech tackler just comes and creams them both, and Edwards is carried off the field a third time. Oh, Edwards. We have Pee Wee, a law student, who was told he would not have to touch the ball. He gets thrown the ball. Um, (laughs) He panics. He flings the ball away. He runs and hides behind a fence where two other Cumberland players are already hiding. No! Yeah, they do not want him to give away their hiding place, so they throw him back over the fence. (laughs) There was one story where Heisman looks over at his bench, and he's like, I don't know that guy. And he goes over and says, aren't you a Cumberland player? And the guy says, don't tell them. Cumberland player, uh, his name is Johnny Dog Nelson. He is chased around the stadium by a dog, a real-life dog. (laughs) So we're full, like, Looney Tunes cartoon right now. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we're nearing the end here, and, and this is kind of like an amazing moment because Cumberland is like, like there's blood in the grass, there are broken <laughs> noses, poor Edwards is knocked out for a third time. These people are destroyed. They have nothing left. Score right now? Score is 173-0. Wow. Okay. There's no hope for these guys. But for some reason, they find it in their hearts to rally. Hmm. And, and so Cumberland, they're in a huddle or whatever, talking about their next play. It must have either been a kickoff or they're blocking an extra point. Block a field goal? Yes. And someone proposes this climb the ladder play, which is now illegal. Oh, God. Oh. And some of the Cumberland players are like, no, no, this is suicidal. We shouldn't do this. But then this young guy, Fishy Woods, he's blonde. He's got like a nice smile. He volunteers. He's like, I'll do it. And you can imagine, like, the crowd must be freaking out right now because, like, watching a team rally when they're so low. I know, I love that. I love it. It's amazing. So one player gets on all fours, grabs the knees of a second player who bends over at the waist and grabs the stomach of a third player. What? As Georgia Tech's kicker kicks the ball, the fourth player, Vishu Woods, he charges at them, runs up their backs, and leaps into the air as high as he can. What? He flies through the air with his arm outstretched, reaching for the ball. (laughs) 
but his fingers just miss. And instead of blocking the ball with his hand, Vishy takes it to the face. Oh, no, yeah. Breaks his nose, probably has a concussion. Oh. Wait, but, but. <laughs> what? He blocks it? He does block he it. Blocks yeah, it? so the score would have been higher if it weren't for Vishy. Vinci Wood. Wood. Yeah, he blocks it with his face. The game ends soon after with a final score of 222 to nothing. Wow. And there were 32 total touchdowns that Tech scored. And was that the highest ever at that point scoring? Yes. And that is actually still the highest today. It's in the the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the highest scoring game. Oh, wow. Okay. I I was just like trying to imagine what was the end like, like the final whistle blown on that final minute. Lay down and try to catch your breath and determine, Mm -hmm. you know, is anything broken? Just exhaustion and frustration. These guys are literally total losers. But they did stick it out to the end and save their school from potential financial ruin. So did they go out for steak dinner? Apparently did they, they go did. out and party? Apparently they went they out did. partying that night in Atlanta, like with their swollen eyes, like barely able to see anything. Uh, but apparently they did. Even Edwards? I, I, I don't know about Edwards. Yeah. I'm still like, I want a Vichy Woods tattoo. And I, <laughs> I can't not love that. So Vichy Woods! Producer, football commentator, Annie McEwen. All right. Well, before we go, uh, I just wanted to tell you about a new series that just came out from our colleagues over at Death, Sex, and Money. It is called Hard. Um, and it's about it's about erectile dysfunction. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was curious how you were going to say that exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and as a woman married to a woman, I wasn't sure if there was going to be much in there for me. Um, but with Anna Sales hosting, it turned out there really was. It's, I mean, there are these frank conversations about what intimacy can be. Um, and there is a really wild history of the invention of Viagra. Um, and the totally shocking physiology of of how the drug works. I didn't know any of this. Um, it just, it's a series that ends up having a lot of of joy mm-hmm. in it. Um, by the end, it, it really um, moves past the idea that, quote unquote, erectile dysfunction even is dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And has these really expansive moments of people talking about new visions of what intimacy can be like this it like it feels like the, the way i've explained it before is it feels like there's sunlight in my veins um mm. like everything inside me turns uh white and euphoric my whole body kind of um disappears into this state of pleasure it feels like i'm injected with pleasure again it's called hard from death sex and money hope you give it a listen Radio Lab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyanasambindam, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sara Kari, Anna Rosquet Paz, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster, with help from Carolyn McCusker and Sarah Sonbach. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Adam Shibill. Mm-hmm.